much. Hearing no objection, we welcome Mr. Bishop to participate in today's hearing. Recognize and introduce Lieutenant Governor Robinson. He will be able to question our witnesses if he is yielded time by a subcommittee member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're very welcome. Finally, I'd like to ask all members and witnesses, both those in person and those appearing remotely, to mute their microphones when you're not speaking. This will help prevent feedback, other technical issues. You may, of course, unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. The late, beloved, and great Representative John R. Lewis, my hero, my dear friend, my partner in making good trouble, and my honored colleague, shed his blood and almost died defending the right to vote and seeking the right to vote. He often said, as he did in 2013, that the right to vote is the most powerful nonviolent tool we have in a democracy. I risked my life defending that right. Some died in the struggle. If we are ever to actualize the true meaning of equality, effective measures such as the Voting Rights Act are still a necessary requirement of democracy. The right to vote is the right that guarantees all other rights in our democracy. Unfortunately, the voting rights of African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, Asian Americans, and other members of racial and language minorities have been threatened and undermined throughout our nation's history. The Voting Rights Act, with an effective preclearance provision, went a long way towards righting that wrong. Sadly, since the Supreme Court's effective neutering of the preclearance provision, voting rights for minorities once again is under sustained assault in many parts of our country. The act's preclearance provision requiring certain jurisdictions with a history of voting discrimination against racial and language minority groups, predominantly though not exclusively in the Deep South, the states of the old Confederacy, to obtain approval of any changes to their voting laws or procedures from the Department of Justice or the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia before such changes could take effect. There was good reasons for that. History repeats itself often. And unfortunately, in the Deep South, from where I hail, that has gone on pre-Civil War, post-Civil War, pre-turn of the century, post-turn of the century, pre-election of 2020, and post-election 2020. This mechanism ensures that the new voting rules and practices and jurisdictions with a history of discrimination were fair to all voters. It rightly prevented potentially discriminatory voting practices from taking effect before they could harm minority voters and affect the election. And in this way, preclearance proved to be a significant means of protection for the rights of minority voters and for what America's about, everybody getting a chance to vote. This is why Congress had repeatedly reauthorized the preclearance provision on an overwhelmingly bipartisan basis. Most recently in 2006, when the House passed reauthorization by a vote of 390 to 33, and the Senate by 98, to zero, a time when there were George Bush compassionate Republicans, a result due in no small part to the substantial, substantial efforts also of then House Judiciary Committee Chairman James Sensenbrenner and then Subcommittee Ranking Member Jerry Nadler. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court effectively gutted the VRA's preclearance requirement in 2013 in the case of Shelby County of Alabama versus Holder when it struck down the geographic coverage formula that determined which jurisdictions would be subject to the preclearance requirement. As a result, the preclearance provision remains dormant unless and until Congress adopts a new coverage formula. Last Congress, I chaired seven hearings of this subcommittee during which we gathered substantial evidence establishing extensive and detailed record of continued and ongoing voter suppression efforts, particularly by those sub jurisdictions that were once subject to the preclearance. Old habits, don't die easy. Old times there are not forgotten. So the effective absence of preclearance since the Shelby County decision is gone. For example, in the wake of Shelby County, North Carolina, excuse me, in the wake of Shelby County, North Carolina passed a sweeping voter suppression law that federal appeals court ultimately held to be unconstitutional, finding that it intentionally, quote, targeted African Americans with almost surgical precision, unquote. Of course, that was after the election, no preclearance, so the damage had been done. We also heard about recent measures to make it difficult or impossible for minority voters to exercise their right to vote. 
These measures include polling place closures and relocations, the purging of voter rolls that disproportionately target racial and ethnic minority voters, discriminatory photo ID laws, and the restrictions on ex-felon voting, all of which are designed to make it harder for African Americans and other racial and ethnic minorities to vote. And things only seem to have gotten worse in this regard since the 2020 election, when in response to the widespread but baseless claims of voter fraud, the big lie, there was no evidence of widespread voter fraud in the 2020 elections. State legislators, though, have introduced a slew of measures to curtail access to the ballot with a disproportionate impact on minority voters. Stacey Abrams laid that out clearly and abundantly to Senator Ted Cruz when he asked about, excuse me, Senator John Kennedy when he asked about racial effects of the Georgia law. And she went on and she went on and she went on until he kind of said, enough, I get it. I don't think he got it. According to the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University Law School, as of a month ago, there was pending legislation in 47 states to restrict voting, and four states had already enacted restricted voting laws. These states include Georgia, a state that had been subject to pre-clearance, pre-Shelby County, where it is now a crime to give food or water to someone standing in line waiting to vote. It's outside the 100-foot border, but it makes it a crime to do it within that 100-foot border, to give food or water. Many of these legislative proposals will limit absentee voting and impose strict, stricter voter ID requirements, while others would make voting registration harder, expand voting roll purges, or adopt flawed practices that would risk improper purges, reduce the amount of days for early voting, and cut back on those early voting periods, according to the Brennan Center report. In the absence of an effective preclearance regime, it is unsurprising that discriminatory measures that have and will continue to undermine the voting rights of racial and language minority voters and erode our democracy. The 2020 election was an election which we should be proud of because the output of the voters, the desire to vote, was the greatest ever. This should be hailed as a great victory of democracy. And yet we're looking at it as a failure and trying to retreat. While Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination in voting, remains in effect, it is by itself less effective, significantly more cumbersome, and often prohibitively expensive way to enforce the act. Most importantly, plaintiffs cannot invoke Section 2 until after an alleged harm has taken place, requiring discrimination of victims to rely solely on such a remedy effectively neuters the act. And even this provision is currently at significant risk in two pending cases before the Supreme Court that could result in Section 2 being substantially curtailed or even struck down as unconstitutional. The onus, therefore, is on Congress to create a new coverage formula to restore the Act's most important enforcement mechanism, its preclearance requirement, and to find other ways to strengthen the Act. Nothing less than the fairness and integrity of our democracy is at stake. I thank our witnesses, and I look forward to their testimony, and I now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Mike Johnson, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, and thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, today's hearing is about the Voting Rights Act, and voting, as we all know and agree, is a fundamental right in this country, and indeed, blood has been shed to secure and sustain it. The Election Clause of the U.S. Constitution, it's Article I, Section 4, gives state legislatures the authority to prescribe the times, places, and manner of holding elections. This means states are responsible for administering elections within their respective jurisdictions. This is an important part of our tradition. Enshrined in the 15th Amendment, it says states must also ensure that voting is accessible and available to every American citizen of voting age. To ensure the integrity of our system, states are also required to administer elections that are free from fraud and administrative errors. We had a unique election in 2020, and everybody knows it. The COVID-19 pandemic presented new challenges for that election cycle, and, and as a result of that, occasioned by the pandemic, there were some pretty dramatic alterations to how states administered their elections. For example, despite known vulnerabilities, many states implemented widespread all-mail in voting. As a result of the 2020 election, many states have enacted or proposed changes to, ch to change their state election laws now. These changes seek to enhance election integrity 
and increase the public's confidence in the election process. By any objective measure, all of us can agree, we know by common experience, we know by talking to our friends and neighbors and constituents that there's a lot of concern about the integrity of our election system. There was a lot of controversy in 2020, and, and that has had some dire consequences. So the states are, are trying to address it in a meaningful and reasonable way. The, the big example that everyone has seen, one of the first out of the gates was the state of Georgia. They recently enacted Senate Bill 202, which expands early weekend voting and codifies the use of drop boxes. In Texas, another example, state lawmakers proposed legislation that would, quote, make it easier to vote and hard to cheat, unquote. I mean, who could oppose that? In Iowa, recently enacted legislation will provide state election officials with revised parameters for election day voting periods, absentee voting, and database maintenance. All of these state measures seek to promote and preserve the sanctity of the ballot box in our election system. But the majority in this Congress, at least many of them, seem to be on a quest to mischaracterize the purpose and effect of these new state laws. Some would rather spread misinformation to instill fear and, sadly, division among America's voters. They would rather pressure corporate America to react and boycott certain states because of baseless allegations of what they call voter suppression. It's a misleading narrative. And that misleading narrative uh, about these changes uh, is also having dark consequences. It's confusing people and it's causing more division. The, the, these changes to the election laws, they say, will cause massive voter suppression or constitute Jim Crow 2.0. Those are wildly inappropriate and unfounded accusations. We want to be clear. Republicans, it, all of our colleagues, all Republicans, I think, across the country want every legally cast ballot to count. We know that that's essential to our system. We want to close the door to fraud and illegally cast ballots at the same time so that all voters of all parties can trust the outcome and know that every election is free and fair. My friends, this is the only way we can preserve our republic. On July 4th, we're about to have our nation's birthday. It's only going to be the 245th anniversary, our 245th year as a nation. We are still an experiment on the world stage. The founders were clear about this. They were setting up a new form of government, a constitutional republic like ours, with our democratic principles. We don't know how long this form of government can last, but what they were certain about and what we know today is that to preserve it, you have to maintain its foundations. And one of those critical foundations to have a government of, by, and for the people, as Lincoln said, is that you must have faith in the election system. So I hope today we can have a productive conversation about the Voting Rights Act and how we can best assist states in enhancing voter protections and increase the integrity of our elections. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I now recognize the chairman of the full committee Gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, largely responsible for the passage of the last Voting Rights Act. Mr. Nadler, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Voting Rights Act is rightly regarded by many as our nation's most important civil rights law. Many Americans, including our late beloved colleague John Lewis, shed their blood in support of its passage. The institutions of government, including this one in which we have the honor of serving, better reflect our nation's diversity because of its vigorous enforcement. During today's hearing, we will hear about how this progress remains under threat in the continued aftermath of the Supreme Court's disastrous 213 Shelby, 2013 Shelby County versus Holder decision and why we need to restore the Voting Rights Act to its full vitality. Without questioning, the VRA has been an unqualified success. It helped to reduce discriminatory barriers to voting and expanded electoral opportunities for people of color to federal, state, and local offices, thereby opening the political process to every American. Despite evidence of the VRA success, however, the Supreme Court in 2013, Shelby County, substituted its own judgment for that of Congress in rejecting Congress's conclusion that the record supported the VRA's re reauthorization. This decision effectively gutted the Act's most important enforcement mechanism, its Section 5 preclearance provision. Specifically, it struck down the formula for determining which states and localities are subject to preclearance, which had the effect of striking down the preclearance provision itself, as there is no longer a basis for subjecting decisions to its requirements. Although it left it up to Congress to pass a valid uh, 
preclearance section. Before the VRA, states and localities passed a host of voter suppression laws, securing the knowledge that it could take many years before the Justice Department uh, could successfully challenge them in court, if at all. As soon as one law was overturned, another would be enacted, essentially set up, setting up a discriminatory game of whack-a-mole. Section 5 of the VRA broke this legal logjam by requiring states and localities with a history of discrimination against racial and ethnic minority voters to submit changes to their voting laws to the Justice Department or to a court for, prior appro for approval prior to taking effect. In the absence of preclearance, predictably, the game of whack-a-mole has returned. Within 24 hours of the Shelby County decision, both Texas Attorney General and North Carolina's General Assembly announced they would reinstitute draconian voter ID laws. Both of these states' laws were later held in federal court to be intentionally racially discriminatory, but during the years between their enactment and the court's final decision, many elections were conducted while the laws remained in place. Since the Shelby County decision, we have seen a dramatic rise in the number of voter suppression measures. Burdensome proof of citizenship laws, significant scale backs to early voting periods, restrictions on absentee ballots, and laws that make it harder to restore the voting rights of formerly incarcerated individuals are just a small sample of recent voting changes that have a disproportionate impact on minority voters. Indeed, there is now a renewed effort underway in the states to enact just these types of voter suppression measures, this time justified under the pretense of addressing the baseless allegations of voter fraud in the 2020 election that have been promoted by former President Trump and his allies, the big lie. To be clear, there is simply no evidence that significant voter fraud or voting irregularities in any way affected the, two, the outcome of the two. 2020 elections. And every single court that has ruled on that, there were 62 cases, has found the same thing unanimously. Yet after having promoted these false allegations to the public, many legislators are now citing a decline in trust in elections to justify draconian voter restrictions. The ranking member said that um, uh, many people doubted the uh, uh, the accuracy of our elections. Sure, because they've been told systematically by Mr. Trump and his allies not to, that, that, that non-existent voting fraud occurred. According to a recent Brennan Center for Justice report, just this year, as of March 24th, state legislators in 47 states have introduced 361 bills with restrictive provisions. There are at least 55 restrictive voting laws currently moving through the legislative process in 24 states. Four states have already enacted new restrictive voting laws. One particularly egregious example is SB 202, a Georgia law that imposes new burden, numerous new burdens on voting, including onerous identification requirements for absentee voting, restrictions for early voting, and most notoriously criminal penalties for offering food or water to voters waiting in long lines to vote. Notably, Georgia was previously subject to the VRA's preclearance regime. And while such actions may violate other provisions of the VRA, time and experience have proven that it takes far longer and is far more expensive to pursue after the fact legal remedies. And once a vote has been denied, while the court proceedings proceed for several years, it cannot be recast. The damage to our democracy is permanent. Yet even Section 2 of the VRA, which prohibits voting discrimination na nationwide after the fact, now may be under threat at the Supreme Court. In a consolidated case currently before the court, the justices are being asked to uphold two Arizona election laws that were challenged under Section 2 as discriminatory to Native American, Latino, and African American voters. It is quite possible that the court, in deciding these cases, could hamstring future plaintiffs' ability to, bring, to even bring or prove a Section 2 claim by imposing a new legal standard that may place additional hurdles that many plaintiffs are unable to meet. The court could even go so far as to strike Section 2 down as unconstitutional. Congress cannot continue to let these challenges to the VRA go unanswered. 
This landmark law is a bulwark of American democracy. It is, at its heart, a necessary remedy to cure the scourge of voting discrimination by preventing our nation from backsliding into a time when denying racial and ethnic minorities the right, the right to vote was a matter of government policy. Though progress has been made, too many Americans are still denied to, the right to vote because of their race, ethnicity, or language or minority status, and the threat of a backslide is ever present. Reauthorization of the VRA historically has been a strongly bipartisan effort. That is why my hope that it is my hope that members on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers of Congress will come together and pass legislation to restore the law to its full strength. I thank the chairman for holding this important hearing, which will provide another opportunity to renew our understanding of the importance of the Voting Rights Act, as well as the challenges it continues to face. I look forward to hearing from the excellent witnesses participating in today's panel, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We welcome our witnesses today. We thank them for participating in today's hearing. I will recognize each of them before their statements and then recognize them for their oral testimony thereafter. Each of your written statements will be entered in the record in its entirety. and We ask you to summarize your statements in five minutes. I understand there are some type of lighting system that you can see here for those witnesses in the chamber, in the, in the, in the committee room, and if it's Green, that means you're on. If it's yellow, that means you've got a minute to go. And if it's red, that means you should be finished. On television, I think there's a spot, uh, not television, on uh, the smartphone or your iPhone or iPad or whatever, there's a WebEx view that should show you how much time you have left on the screen. Before proceeding with the testimony, I'd like to remind all witnesses appearing here that you're uh, under penalty of uh, the law, if your testimony is not truthful and your answers to this subcommittee aren't truthful. Any false statement would subject you to prosecution under Section 1001 of Title 18 of the U.S. Code. Our first witness is Julian Castro. The only thing better than one Castro is two Castros. And you are shadowed by your other Castro. And we welcome you to the committee room, Mr. Congressman Castro. Mr. Castro served as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development from 2014 to 2017 during the Obama administration. Prior to that, he was the mayor of San Antonio, Texas from 2009 to 2014, also a candidate for the Democratic nomination for president in 2020. Today, he serves on the board of the LBJ Foundation, is an advocate for the protection of voting rights for Latinos and other Americans, and he is also known as the twin brother of our colleague, the honorable, distinguished, erudite, Leader, Representative Joaquin Castro. Secretary Castro received his JD from Harvard Law School and his BA from Stanford University. And I suspect his brother did too. I think there was kind of a, a tag team. Secretary Castro, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to Chairman Cohen, to Chairman Nadler, uh, to Vice Chair Ross, uh, Ranking Member Johnson, and all the members of the committee. Uh, I'm honored to address this committee on the fundamental and timely issue of safeguarding the franchise. Uh, my testimony this morning, as you noted, is... Ah, will do. My uh, testimony this morning, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, is a family affair uh, in more ways than one. Uh, my brother, Joaquin, is your colleague and serves uh, as a representative of the 20th Congressional District. Joaquin and I grew up on the west side of San Antonio, Texas, a working class, predominantly Mexican-American neighborhood. We were raised by our mother, Rosie Castro, who was an outspoken activist in the Mexican-American civil rights movement of the 1970s. She became an activist because she felt her community was being overlooked and that the rights of Latinos like her were not being protected and advanced. It's fitting that I join you today to discuss the Voting Rights Act because just under 50 years ago, my mother was compiling data and research on behalf of the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund for a presentation on the exact same topic that would be used in preparation for testimony to this very committee. She and many other advocates believed that there had not been enough progress on voting rights for Latinos and that the 1965 Voting Rights Act had left gaps that states and local communities were exploiting 
to disenfranchise and suppress voters. Unfortunately, five decades later, I'm here for very much the same reason. In my home state of Texas today, there is an all-out assault on the right to vote. For generations, Texas has been a testing ground for devious ways to restrict access to the polls. Since the Shelby decision in 2013, the state has cut more polling locations than any state in the nation. Texas enacted a strict voter ID law that permits firearm licenses to be used to vote or prohibits the use of student IDs. And lawmakers have used things like voter registration deadlines, restricted voting hours, and limitations on early voting to chip away at the franchise of millions of people. In fact, on the very day the 1965 Voting Rights Act was signed into law, President Lyndon B. Johnson sued his home state of Texas to block the poll tax, a policy Texas would be the last to eliminate. But only through a ballot referendum passed by the voters in 1966, the 24th Amendment, which prohibited the poll tax, was ratified by the states in 1964, but Texas did not actually ratify the amendment until 2009. Today, the legislature in my home state continues to debate a new round of voting bills that are defended by lawmakers with the same justification used to defend the poll tax. Under the guise of voter integrity, lawmakers have introduced legislation that would slash voting hours and the number of voting machines at polling locations, make it much more difficult to vote by mail, and even allow partisan poll watchers to film voters as they cast a ballot. And this is nothing new for Texas. Just hours after the Supreme Court's 2013 Shelby decision effectively eliminated the preclearance requirement of the Voting Rights Act for states like Texas, state leaders advanced a photo ID law that had been rejected by the Justice Department just one year earlier. The new law, which is still in place today, swiftly disenfranchised 600,000 registered voters that didn't have the requisite ID, a disproportionate number being black or Latino. The elimination of preclearance has allowed Texas to become the most difficult state to vote in in the nation, as well as one of the most gerrymandered. More than ever, we need stronger federal protections that restore and realize the voting rights of our citizens, revitalize the voting rights of our citizens. We need an updated Voting Rights Act to make good on the promise of the 15th Amendment that no citizen be denied the right to vote based on race. Voting rights shouldn't be a partisan issue. As recently as 2006, the Senate voted unanimously and the House nearly unanimously to renew every section of the Voting Rights Act, including the preclearance provision. Congress knew in each of the four times they reauthorized the VRA that we must protect the rights of voters and reaffirm the American principle of anti-discrimination. They knew then this timeless truth. The right to vote shouldn't depend on the color of one's skin, how much money one has, or what state one lives in. It's a right guaranteed to every eligible American citizen. It's the cornerstone of our democracy. And it's what the late Representative John Lewis, for whom the New Voting Rights Act is named, described in his final letter as, quote, the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. I urge you to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Castro. Good to have you back. And uh, I want you to know that the, the Choice Neighborhood grant that we got when you were there is doing great. Thank you. Uh, our next witness is the Reverend William J. Barber II. In a moment, I will recognize Representative Ross, who understandably, as the vice chair of the subcommittee and a North Carolinian, and a friend wants to introduce Reverend Barber. Before so, I would like to say a few words. Reverend Barber is an amazing man who, at the, as a young man, has already assumed the mantle as, the, in my opinion, the premier spokesperson in the United States of America on civil rights issues. On Saturday, he was in Memphis, Tennessee, stopping off on his way to Jackson, Mississippi to start a new Poor People's Campaign. In Memphis, he spoke about racial environmental injustice, the Bahalia Pipeline going through a minority neighborhood and potentially threatening our precious aquifer where we get our drinking water. The previous rally before Reverend Barber came, Vice President Gore spoke. He told us it was racist, it was reckless, and it was a ripoff. Reverend Barber told us 
Not here, not now, not ever on our watch. We thank you for coming to Memphis to leave Memphis. I now recognize Congressman Ross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, I'm delighted to have Reverend Dr. William Barber with us today. I'm privileged to have known, worked with, and worshipped with Reverend Barber for years, and it's really, truly an honor um, to introduce him. Reverend Barber serves as the president of the Repairers of the Bridge. He's co-chair of the Four People's Campaign, bishop with the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary, pastor at Greenleaf Christian Church, where I have worshiped, and the author of four books. Reverend Barber previously served as president of the North Carolina NAACP, and he currently sits on the National NAACP Board of Directors. Reverend Barber has made it his life's mission to lift people up. He's been a champion for voting rights, and people's rights, both in North Carolina and on the national stage. He led the charge in securing same-day voter registration in North Carolina in 2007. While, while I was the one who introduced the bill in the General Assembly, I know that it would not have passed without Reverend Barber's advocacy and leadership. Reverend Barber is the architect of the moral movement, which began as a weekly Moral Monday protest at the North Carolina General Assembly in 2013, and I served in the General Assembly at that time. During these gatherings, which I witnessed on Monday nights, protesters found themselves locked out of the General Assembly and arrested for exercising their First Amendment right to petition the government for redress of grievance, even though there was never a threat to those inside. I never felt threatened. Recently, Reverend Barber helped relaunch the moral movement as part of the nationwide Poor People's Campaign, which famously which was famously begun by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and triggered the historic civil rights protests across the nation. Reverend Barber is a MacArthur Foundation Genius Award recipient with a national following and countless speaking credits to his name and he continues to lead services at his modest church in Goldsboro, North Carolina. He is the embodiment of a life lived in service to others, and I'm honored to welcome him to this committee. I yield back Chairman Cullen. Thank you, Congresswoman Ross, for that uh, personal introduction. And without further ado, Reverend Barber, you're recognized for five minutes. I think you're muted. You're muted. Thank you, Chairman Cohen, uh, for your great work. And thank you to my dear friend, the Representative Congressman Woman Ross. The threat of free exercise of the ballot by the Negro and white masses is what created a segregated society. This is what happened when the Negro and white masses of the South threatened to unite and build a great society a society where greed and poverty would be done away with. The battle to suppress the vote and the battle to suppress labor rights has been the tactic used by the Southern white aristocracy to hold on to their money and their power. Martin Luther King, 1968. In the wake of this moment, an organized coup attempted emboldened by hate, lies, and racism on January the 6th, 2021 at the U.S. Capitol, the people of America and this Congress sit at the crossroads of a historic moment, calling for us to fight for the soul of our democracy and enact full protections of our sacred right to vote. By expanding voting rights and fully restoring the Voting Rights Act Section 5 free clearance. As we come together this morning, less than 100 days since the inauguration of a new American government, at least 361 bills have been introduced in 47 legislatures to suppress the right to vote. In my state of North Carolina, we have labored for over eight years defending against an all-out attack on voting rights. In North Carolina, the majority that gained power in North Carolina General Assembly in 2010 
they quickly redrew both state legislative districts and U.S. congressional districts in their favor, illegally using race as a primary indicator of voters who oppose their agenda. After years of heroic fighting, both in the streets and in the courts, by the Forward Together Moral Movement, a unanimous U.S. Supreme Court would issue a remarkable per curiam decision striking down as a sweeping unconstitutional racial gerrymandering the maps that created an unaccountable legislative supermajority in the state house. It was described by one judge as an unconstitutionally constituted legislature. This unconstitutionally le constituted legislature it was set in place in 2011. And then in 2013, uh, the Supreme Court <clears throat> gutted the Voting Rights Act in Shelby versus Holder by eliminating Section 5. In just a matter of hours after the ruling was handed down, the unconstitutionally constituted extremist supermajority of the North Carolina General Assembly announced that because Shelby had rid them of the headache of the Voting Rights Act pre-clearance protections, they could now move forward with what we would come to know as the monster voter suppression law, a sweeping omnibus voter suppression bill that erected a slate of stringent racially discriminatory barriers to the ballot. The law eliminated same-day registration, pre-registration for 16 and 17-year-olds, out of precinct ballots, the first week of early voting, and instituted one of the nation's most stringent voter ID laws. This monster voter suppression law, the worst of its kind in the nation after Shelby, was only possible because pre-clearance protection was no longer in place. After years of organizing and legal battles and even civil disobedience and the rest, the monster voter suppression law uh, was eventually struck down as intentionally racially discriminatory. In July 2016, a unanimous panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit held that the law targeted African Americans with almost surgical precision and imposed cures for problems that did not exist. As we sit here today, North Carolina's legislature is still trying to implement voter suppression laws and Republican Congress per, uh, persons from our state have refused to push for restoration of the Voting Rights Act today marks for 2,858 days, or seven years, nine months, and 28 days. We cannot continue this assault on the right to vote. We are living in a time when voters of color hold increased potential for political power, more than 30% of America's eligible voters. We are also living in a time in which America is home to 140 million poor and low-income people, over 43.5% of the population in the richest country in the world. This includes 39 million children, 74.2 million women, 60.4% or 26 million Black people, and over 66 million white people. Increasing the harm on these 140 million individuals and people of color in this nation comes whenever the right to vote is restricted or undermined. As Dr. King said, it is used as a tool whenever there is the threat for black and white, we might say today brown, Asian, and indigenous to come together and vote in a way that transforms our political power and the economic power in this country. We must pass and fully restore and expand the Voting Rights Act, Section 5, preclearance, and we must do it now. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Barber. Our next witness is Mark Robinson. Mr. Robinson is Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson of the state of North Carolina, and I recognize our guest member, Mr. Dan Bishop, Representative Dan Bishop, to introduce Lieutenant Governor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mark Keith Robinson burst onto the public scene April 3rd, 2018. In a public comment delivered to the City Council of Greensboro, North Carolina, on the subject of the reflex of government to diminish Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens in response to shootings that occur. The viral video of that event um, was well received, but 
and his message was powerful on the subject matter he spoke to, but the real thunderclap was a point in the message when Mr. Robinson told the city council, it's about time you start listening to the majority. Let me tell you who that is. I'm the majority, is what Mark Robinson said in words that galvanized the public. Over months that followed, he emerged as a national figure and demonstrated himself to be a thoughtful and learned student of history. And he brought a fresh perspective and he revealed himself as a natural communicator. In the, in the ensuing two years, the enthusiastic, enthusiastic response to Mr. Robinson led him to run for, and he was elected uh, to the, as the first black lieutenant governor in North Carolina's history, fittingly as a Republican. No person in public life today better articulates the essence of our core freedoms and opportunities, or more effectively debunks the absurd wokeism that afflicts our political discourse than Mark Robinson. Lieutenant Governor Robinson epitomizes the promise of American liberty and opportunity. And I can think of no one better to cut through the hyperpartisan exaggerations we have heard in recent discourse over voter integrity and to provide an honest assessment of the best ways to ensure that all Americans can realize the American dream regardless of their background than Lieutenant Governor Robinson. Lieutenant Governor, Thank you for being here today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cohen and Ranking Member Johnson and all the members of the committee for allowing me to speak today. I'm honored to sit before this committee and testify before this body on such an important topic, a topic that hits close to home for me. You see, I'm the first black lieutenant governor of North Carolina. And I hail from Greensboro, home of the Woolworth sit-ins, an epicenter of the civil rights movement. I grew up poor as the ninth of 10 children in a home marred by alcoholism, but I had a mother who was a strong woman of faith and she sustained us. She was also a woman who lived through the terribleness of Jim Crow and witnessed firsthand the sacrifices made by those to ensure that black voices would be heard in government. I know right now she is up in heaven smiling as I, she sees her son here sitting in this committee hearing. But today I'm not here to talk about myself. I'm here to talk about voter discrimination and election integrity. The subject of this hearing is the evolving landscape of voter discrimination, and it certainly has throughout our nation's history. Let me say that I am very proud of the history in this nation of my people. My people were put in the belly of ships bound in chains and endured the middle passage. My people were whipped, beaten, and sold as, pro as property during slavery. During Reconstruction and throughout Jim Crow, black people were intimidated, harassed, and even killed to keep them from having a voice in government. Symbols like chains, nooses, and burnt crosses are not just symbols of death, they are symbols of forced and coerced silence. The sacrifices of our ancestors so I could have the opportunity to become the first black lieutenant governor of my state, to see a black man sit in the White House for two terms, and for millions of us to be leaders in business, athletics, government, and culture, add up to an incredible story of victory. But today, we hear Georgia law being compared to Jim Crow, that black voices are being silenced, and that black voices are being kept out. How? By bullets? By bombs? By nooses? No, by requiring a free ID to secure the vote. Let me say that again, by requiring a free ID to secure the vote. How absolutely preposterous. Am I to believe that black Americans who have overcome the atrocities of slavery, who were victorious in the civil rights movement, and now sit in the highest levels of this government cannot figure out how to get a free ID to secure their votes? that they need to be coddled by politicians because they don't think we can figure out how to make our voices heard. Are you kidding me? The notion that black people must be protected from a free ID to secure their votes is not just insane, it is insulting. 
just a few days ago, excuse me, uh, uh, and let me tell you something about this. This is, doesn't have anything to do with justice. This has everything to do with power. Just a few days ago, Vice Pres the vice president went to the very place that I mentioned, the Woolworth counter in Greensboro. But you know who wasn't there? You know who wasn't invited? My good friend Clarence Henderson, who is a civil rights icon. He sat at that counter and endured the suffering and pain to make sure that black voices were heard. And why was he left out? Because he's of a different political persuasion. You might ask why this is so, and I'll tell you plainly. The goal of some individuals in government is not to hear the voices of black Americans at all. It's to hear the voices that fit their narratives and ultimately help keep power with one group. And that's what this all is all about. It's about power. Just look at HR1, it's despicable. The entire thing is designed to keep one party in power and ensure they stay there indefinitely. And how do they plan to do that? By taking away the rights of states given by the Constitution to govern their own elections, to mandate a wish list, a partisan, a partisan wish list that comes down from that federal government. Some of these items include using government dollars to fund campaigns in order to give an advantage to one party, mandating that felons are allowed to vote, including illegal immigrants on voter rolls, and of course, trying to ban states from having voter ID. The last thing I'll say is this. Many people know that I'm a strong proponent of the Second Amendment, and I always will be. I believe that the right to keep and bear arms should always be available to law-abiding citizens. But the first line of defense in maintaining the integrity of the Second Amendment is having an ID to show and requiring that ID when you purchase that firearm. In the same way, I believe that voter ID is our first line of defense for protecting the integrity of the right to vote. And that's what this should be about. It should be about integrity, not power. Thank you. Thank you. Our final witness is Jacqueline DeLeon. Ms. DeLeon is a staff attorney with the Native American Rights Fund and a member of the Isleta Pueblo. As a staff attorney at NARF, he helped lead field hearings across Indian country on Native American voting rights, co-authored NARF's report obstacles at every turn, barriers to political participation faced by Native American voters, and practices and ongoing voter rights litigation. He's testified before Congress on multiple occasions detailing voting rights issues in Indian country. Ms. DeLeon received her JD from Stanford Law School and her BA from Princeton University. She checked clerk for Judge William H. Walls of the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey and Chief Justice Dana Fobb of the Alaska Supreme Court. Ms. DeLeon, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Cohen and Ranking Member Johnson and members of the subcommittee. My name is Jacqueline DeLeon. I'm a member of the Estrada Pueblo, and I'm a staff attorney with the Native American Rights Fund known as NARC, the nation's largest and oldest nonprofit law firm dedicated to advancing the rights of Native Americans. Thank you for having me testify on the pressing need for federal action to fully restore the Voting Rights Act. In 2018, the Native American Voting Rights Coalition completed a series of nine field hearings across Indian country, which I co-led. We heard from approximately 125 witnesses generating thousands of pages of transcripts about voting in federal and state elections. Our findings are extensively documented in a report I re released in June of 2020, and I'm humbled to be carrying their stories with me here today. We are updating that report and will provide the subcommittee with a copy as soon as it is completed. NARC has also successfully brought a number of seminal Native American voting rights cases in the last four years, including challenges to North Dakota's voter ID law, a challenge to Montana's ballot collection ban, a challenge to Alaska's witness signature requirement during a pandemic, and a 2020 lawsuit challenging the refusal to open an in-person polling location on the Blackfeet Reservation. In that case, county officials were given the option of all mail-in voting because of the pandemic. Ponderay County chose to keep in-person voting at their county seat, which ensured access for the over 90% white residents, but denied in-person voting to black seat tribal members who do not get mail delivered to their homes and who would have had to travel 120 miles to vote. Only after we sued did the county agree to on-reservation voting access. Relying upon the 14th and 15th Amendments and the VRA, 
Native American voters have filed nearly 100 lawsuits with a success rate of over 90%. These cases have been litigated in front of judges appointed by Republican and Democratic presidents, and yet the overwhelming fact patterns compel relief. In short, the facts are so bad, we nearly always win. Today, many Native American reservations are rural, distant from the nearest offshore reservation border town because of official policies to forcibly remove, segregate them on remote and undesirable land. Travel to voting services, DMVs, and post offices can be hundreds of miles away. Due to ongoing discrimination and governmental neglect, many Native Americans live in overcrowded homes that do not have addresses, do not receive mail, and are located on dirt roads that can be impassable in wintry November. There are Native Americans today that cannot access basic government services. The need for federal action is urgent and compelling. This year, legislators in states across the country are capitalizing upon these vulnerabilities and making it unreasonably difficult for Native Americans to vote. NARC is monitoring over 100 discriminatory bills introduced in 14 states with sizable Native American populations. Arizona, in particular, has taken advantage of the suspension of Section 5, introducing at least 27 proposed bills that make it too hard for Natives to vote. A fully functioning Voting Rights Act would force objective review of these laws. Instead, NARC is preparing for costly and time-consuming litigation. Finally, in case there's any doubt that Native Americans face overt discrimination on the basis of race, NARC has collected extensive evidence of racism faced by Native American voters. For example, this past election, the weekend before Election Day, a man won the local costume contest in a town bordering the Fort Peck Reservation. He was dressed in a full Ku Klux Klan attire. As a tribal member relayed to me, this is why satellite voting sites are so important for our tribal members. Not everyone is comfortable going into places in Glasgow, and not everyone in Glasgow is going to make our tribal members feel welcome. These racist attitudes are not just the work of private individuals. Voting officials also discriminate against Native Americans. Less than 10 years ago in South Dakota, Native Americans were forced to vote out of a chicken coop. In 2018, a San Juan County clerk in Utah committed fraud to kick a Native American candidate off the ballot who was only reinstated after a federal court ordered it. Overt discrimination remains a present day problem in need of present day solutions. It is no surprise that experiences like these have provoked a widespread distrust of federal, state, and local governments among Native Americans. Today, I place my trust in the federal government and in this committee to provide the protections Native Americans need and deserve so they may vote safely and free from racist discrimination. Despite widespread voter suppression in Indian country, we do not have the resources to bring every case. I urge this committee to do the necessary work of investigating and recording these injustices and to craft a coverage formula that restores the voting rights act. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. We will now go into our question phase, and I will first recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. You know, we've heard a lot today from the other side the other side's witnesses about the state legislatures making the laws, and that's our system. That's the system that gave us counting beans in a jar. That's the system that gave us a system where African Americans were denied the right to vote for many years in every opportunity, in every way possible. We can't just fold up our hands and give it to the state legislatures, because if we did that, we know we'd be back in Jim Crow times. Reverend Barber, the entire state of North Carolina was technically not subject to the Voting Rights Act preclearance provision. Some of it was, of course, most of it, I think. But dozens of individual counties were covered at the time, decided before Shelby County v. Holder in 2013. How have discriminatory voting practices evolved over time in the state of North Carolina since the Shelby County decision? Well, thank you, Chairman Clark. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. You know, um, Jim Crow, like James Crow Esquire, dresses up in a suit today, always claim it to be benign and non-racial. Uh, but when examined under the microscope of the Constitution, they are always found to be racist. And what we know is more than 60 times prior to the Shelby decision that we in North Carolina have to fight um, 
racialized uh, voter discrimination. Now, I will admit we had to fight Democrats and Republicans. Let's be honest about that. Uh, since 1965, since the case, since Shelby, we have had the worst voter suppression laws uh, since the days of all-out Jim Crow attempted to be passed and passed and implemented and placed on the people of North Carolina only to later, after extended legal battles, to be found, as the court says, surgical racism. And what's absurd is for someone to say that a Supreme Court, the majority of which were appointed by Republicans, and uh, the Fourth Circuit, which was a three-panel uh, uh, panel, two whites, one African-American, are uh, absurd when they found under the law that this was surgical, surgical racism. And that's the ugliness of it. And if preclearance would have been in place, they would not have made it. Those laws would have not made it onto books and undermined the voting rights of African-Americans, Black people, brown people, native, indigenous people, poor people in North Carolina. And sec lastly, if Republicans are so sure that they are not engaging in racism, they would have no problem with preclearance because all preclearance does is checks it out before it's implemented into law. Thank you, Reverend Barber. It was said here by, I believe, your lieutenant governor that uh, there's nothing wrong with an ID, that it's not racist at all. It's simple to get. Personally, I dread the idea of getting a real ID, which we'll eventually have to get, because in Memphis, it's hard to get, it's a long way to drive to get to a place to get a real ID and a long line, and I don't want to deal with it. Are there not a lot of people, possibly in rural North Carolina and in even inner city North Carolina, who might not have access to cars to make it easy? People born a long time ago and getting an ID is difficult? Well, it's worse than that. First of all, this is not just about an ID. It's about strict photo ID that will say, for instance, a gun ID is valid, but an ID from a college or a university is not. And even when you claim it's free, that we have a restriction. You cannot make uh, someone have to spend a pack of a money, even gas money, new form of a poll tax to try to make someone have to go get something that's not needed and that's being implemented for a problem that's not a problem. The problem of fraud, the claim of fraud is fraudulent in of itself. But lastly, Chairman Cohen, what we should also recognize is that Republicans and Democrats in North Carolina long ago settled on something called signature attestation with a five-year felony. That's what we did in North Carolina. You have to sign and affirm. Uh, they, they lie when you say you don't have, there's a way, when you, when you first, after you get registered, it's proven that you are who you are. And then when you come, you have to sign and, and a signature attestation with the penalty of a five-year felony. And there was no instances of fraud. This whole issue of fraud happened after North Carolina voted for President Obama in 2008. And then there was all of these claims that something went wrong. Nothing went wrong. People just had the right to expand the vote through same-day registration and early voting, and they chose to vote. I asked the question, always Representative Cohen, that the judge asked when we went to Cape Court. He looked at the Republican lawyer and asked this question. Why is it that you do not want people to vote? Just answer that for me. Why is it that you do not want people to vote? That's the fundamental question. That's why we need the Voting Rights Act preclearance restored. Thank you, Reverend Barber. My time is up, but I will answer your question. A Republican lawyer before the Supreme Court recently in a what case on voting rights said, we can't win if everybody votes. Mr. Net, uh, Mr. Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to say, Lieutenant Governor Robinson, I think your uh, testimony this morning was so compelling. And I wish uh, every American could see it. And we're going to clip that video, and I promise you we'll get it out there. Because you're, you're sharing the truth. And, um, you know, we've just heard the last five minutes, uh, Reverend Barber has lamented today what he sees as the situation in, in North Carolina. And, of course, uh, we all agree it is a shame that Democrat-controlled state governments established Jim Crow laws to prevent black Americans from voting and exercising other freedoms. But North Carolina is your state too, Lieutenant Governor Robinson, and you're the first black lieutenant governor in the history of the state. You're wildly popular there, and you all see why this morning. But I just want to ask you for your perspective. Let me ask you, is there, is there rampant is voter there discrimination occurring around this country, indoor specifically in North Carolina? Is your microphone on? Make sure that button, there you go. 
There absolutely is not, and I'm confident in that. Um, you know, for me, this entire thing goes again back to this whole issue, and it always goes back to the issue. Whenever we talk about this issue, it always goes back to the ID issue. Having that ID to vote puts up that first firewall to create the integrity that we need for our elections. And I, I just can't express, <laughs> let me even tell you a story. I'm a, I have a father-in-law who was in prison for 43 years. A black man in prison for 43 years. Very first thing he did when he got out of prison was get a driver's license. Where is this no access to IDs that exist? Why do we look at poor people and brown people and think that they're less than and that they can't figure out how our systems work? They can't figure out where the DMV is. They can't figure out where this agency is to go down and get this ID that is being offered. I can't express to you how insulting this is for someone to look at me and actually say that the reason why we need or don't need IDs to vote is because you and your people can't find your way down to get one, that there are restrictions somehow. The notion is absolutely asinine and ridiculous. And I would say absolutely unequivocally not. There are, there's no rampant uh, uh, discrimination against voters. There's none. There's, there's, it doesn't exist. I mean, in some corners it might exist, sure. In some, some far off place, maybe once or twice somewhere, somebody might be in someone's mind, but a systematic a systematic effort to suppress the votes of black people? That is preposterous. It's just as preposterous as the notion that as a black American, I can't get a free ID to vote. Thank you for that clarity and conviction. Let me ask you another question. The election clause of the Constitution, federal Constitution, gives state legislatures the authority, as you know, to prescribe the times, places, and manner of holding elections within their jurisdictions. The Constitution thus leaves it to the states to administer elections within their boundaries. Let me ask you, from your perspective as a lieutenant governor, are states still best situated to determine how to run elections, or should we just federalize this whole thing and put Congress in charge? A absolutely. The state should remain in charge because, from my vantage point, we're looking at a bill here that's 880 pages, some 880 pages uh, of a partisan, uh, unconstitutional power grab. You know, the federal government, there are a lot of things in here that they'll argue and say, oh, it's just, uh, it's just, we're just insinuating this. We understand how that works with the federal government. There's an insinu insinu insinuation, and then there's a request, and then there's a demand. We need to stop it at the insinuation. We need to stop this at the insinuation that somehow the people in Washington, D.C. know better than the people in North Carolina. You do not and we will not tolerate it. <laughs> Everybody over here is saying amen. This is some refreshing common sense, isn't it? Let me ask you one more question. We only have 40 seconds or so. When it comes to voting, do you believe we need to give citizens greater responsibility when exercising their right to vote? Absolutely. Again, I said I'm a huge proponent of the Second Amendment, but the very first thing with the Second Amendment is that ID that you show when you go to have that, uh, buy that firearm. But there's something I tell everybody before you partake of the Second Amendment, you need to take like, a look in the mirror and ask yourself, am I responsible enough to own a firearm? And if the answer is no, don't buy one. When it comes to voting, you have six, four years for president, six years for Senate, two years, two years for uh, House of Representatives. I have complete confidence in the people of the United States of America and the people of my state that in those two, four, or six years, they can do due diligence, get that ID, find out where they're voting, make a date, and be there on the date. I have full and complete confidence in them that they can do that. And I think the rules should reflect that. Hallelujah, and thank you for being there. Here, I yield back. Before I recognize Mr. Nadler, I want to correct myself. I don't like false. Yeah, it, what was said before the Supreme Court by the Republican attorney was not that we cannot win elections. What he said to Justice Amy Coney, Coney Bryant Barrett because these laws disqualifying, say, out-of-precinct ballots would put us at a competitive disadvantage relative to Democrats. Politics is a zero-sum game, and every vote they get through unlawful interpretation of Section 2 hurts us. It's the difference between winning an election and losing. Remarkable moment for the pivotal moment for voting rights. State Republicans have advanced a spate of laws trying to change the law. So 
in essence, they said it, but it's something different. Mr. Nadler, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lieutenant Governor uh, uh, Robinson, briefly, because I have a lot of questions, uh, how do you justify uh, uh, counting for voting purposes a hunting license, but not a state college I issued ID? But a state college ID, how do, how do you not qualify that? Your microphone, Gus. Yeah. Again, we can argue about the semantics about what type of ID should be uh, accepted. And, we, and, we, and, and that's an open and honest conversation that we can have. And I don't mind having that conversation. From my purview as Lieutenant Governor, and if I made the decision, it would be a state-issued ID only. That is it. Thank you. Reverend Barber, some of my colleagues would argue that the Voting Rights Act success demonstrates that it's no longer needed. That the U.S. has elected an African-American president and vice president, that minority representation in an elected government has increased substantially, and that minority voters play decisive roles in elections and have much higher turnout rates than when the Voting Rights Act was first enacted decades ago. What's your response to that argument? My response is that the facts don't play it out, and not the facts that somebody says is the fact without them being facts, but under the microscope of the courts and the Constitution. Remember, in North Carolina, the law was tried under the courts, the Supreme Court, a majority Republican, and the Supreme Court, and a three-panel federal district um, um, court said that what they did after the Shelby decision was a mosque was voter suppression, surgical voter suppression, intentional voter suppression. This is not hyperbole. This is not about semantics. And it's not just about photo ID. They attempted to eliminate same-day registration, pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds out of uh, a precinct ballots the first week of early voting and instituted one of the nation's most stringent photo ID, and we did not have a conversation about it. The courts looked at it under the microscope of the Constitution after the Shelby decision and said, this is surgical. This is intentional racism. That's what the court said, and that and, and showed that we need preclearance, and there should be no fear of preclearance. If you are not discriminating, you would not be afraid of the preclearance portion of the voting rights. Act. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, Secretary Castro, many of the so-called election integrity laws that are currently making their way through state legislatures are practices that have been shown to suppress minority voter turnout, such as restrictions on absentee voting, restrictions on early voting, more stringent voter ID requirements, or laws that make it easier for officials to purge voters from voter registration rolls. How do these proposals for so-called election integrity laws discriminate against minority voters? Great question, Great question uh, Chairman Nadler. They work all together. It's not just about uh, a, a photo ID requirement. It's much more than that. They work all together to have a disparate impact on uh, people of color, whether we're talking about my home state of Texas or a number of other states. Uh, today, in the Texas legislature, for instance, we have uh, House Bill 6 and Senate Bill 7 that, among other things, limit the hours of early voting. Uh, they prohibit drive-through voting, which Harris County, as uh, Representative Jackson Lee knows well, instituted recently. Uh, they take other steps, like further criminalizing um, uh, what can even be innocuous activities of helping somebody, assisting somebody to early vote. Uh, they uh, allocate a new formula for, uh, they establish a new formula for allocating how voting centers in counties with a population over one million people are supposed to be uh, distributed according to state legislative districts. So this is an entire ecosystem of discrimination that goes into shaving essentially off the ability of somebody to conveniently access the ballot. Uh, and this is clear that in Texas, uh, you know, from closing 750 polling locations since 2012, uh, 
uh, to seeing, I believe now we're 47th in, 43rd or 47th in voter turnout. The proof is in the pudding. They've accomplished what they've wanted to accomplish. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Jim Jordan, the ranking member of the full committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Robinson, I want to thank you for your service to your, your state and for your, your powerful testimony. Uh, we appreciate all that you do. And I want to yield to uh, your fellow uh, member here from uh, your great state of North Carolina, Mr. Bishop. I thank the gentleman from Ohio, Lieutenant Governor Robinson. Um, Democrats have characterized state laws uh, adopting photo ID like Georgia, which really liberalized just about everything about its voting system except to require consistent uh, use of voter ID recently. And uh, Democrats have characterized that as Jim Crow 2.0. And you just heard the chairman a moment ago um, attempt to draw an equivalence between uh, the old uh, uh, beans in a jar, guess how many there are as a means of depri depriving blacks of the right to vote in Jim Crow right. as the same thing as voter ID. Right. Uh, what do you make of that? Uh, I, again, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't understand the logic. And, you know, a lot of folks are saying that this is not, a, not, not just about voter ID. Let's go ahead and cut down the brass tax. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's about voter ID because we understand that voter ID is that first line of defense in maintaining election integrity. It's the same way if someone came in here and said, hey, let's get rid of ID requirement to buy firearms. Boy, this place would go crazy because we know that'd be ridiculous. So it is, it's about that. It's about the, the voter ID laws. Uh, but that notion uh, that this is somehow Jim Crow, uh, you know, I think some folks need a history lesson about what happened during Jim Crow. During Jim Crow, it wasn't just a poll tax. It wasn't just a bean, a jar of beans. Guess how many jars of beans in it? If you stepped outside the line during Jim Crow, you'd find yourself swinging from a tree or buried somewhere behind somebody's barn or all cut up, or burned out of your house. Requiring an ID to vote is just simple American responsibility. In our state, I call it common sense legislation for the common good. Keeps us all honest. And to say that somehow poor people, black people, can't be involved in that responsibility, again, is insulting. It's insulting. And so uh, I, I completely agree with you that uh, it, it's not the same thing, not even close, not even on the same scale. It's not even in the same arena. Lieutenant Governor Robinson, uh, in North Carolina in 2018, the voters of North Carolina amended our state constitution by a fairly overwhelming vote to require photo ID. And since that time, an enabling law passed by the General Assembly which goes well beyond, sir, what you said you would uh, consider to be valid ID. Absolutely. It includes student IDs. Absolutely. It even has been amended to include the ID if someone holds that they receive public assistance are all allowed. Absolutely. But, a judge, but judges have delayed the effectiveness of that law on the grounds that it is racist. What do you say to that, sir? I'd say to that it's a perfect, it's a perfect example of what's going on here today. We have a few elitists who believe that they know better than the people of the state of North Carolina. A few people, two or three judges that said, I know that 55, 60% of the people of North Carolina said they won't voter ID, but I don't think so, and I'm a king, and I know better than you, so I'm going to strike that law down. That's the same thing we see going on in this chamber right now. That's the same thing we see with HR1. Folks who sit high, look low, say, I know better than you. I know your state better than you. I know your people better than you. I'm gonna make the decisions for you, again, not going to happen. Not going to happen. That old saying, not going to happen, Captain, it's alive and well in North Carolina. It's not going to happen. Lieutenant Governor Robinson, uh, Reverend Barber says in North Carolina has been a continuous since 2010, the worst voter suppression campaign laws have been passed and implemented 
Sir, how did you become the first black lieutenant governor elected in this past election if the people of North Carolina, through their elected representatives, are working to suppress voters of African-American? Uh, it, it's not about voter suppression. I'm going to tell you what my campaign was about. My campaign was about suppressing the lies from the left. That's what it was about. And when I told the people of North Carolina the truth, they heard it and they came running and they pushed my name. And not just white people, but all people that believe in our message. And again, I'm gonna reiterate this statement one more time. What is going on in this room right now is all about this right here and the power grab that it ensues. Thanks, sir, you'll bet. I believe Ms. Ross would be next because Mr. Raskin's on the floor voting. Ms. Ross, you're recognized for five minutes. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, since I've served in the General Assembly during some of the time of uh, some of these voter suppression laws, it's uh, just uh, deja vu all over again. Um, I've been working on voting rights issues for decades. I led redistricting cases as a civil rights attorney. I chaired the elections committee in the North Carolina General Assembly. I joined with Reverend Barber in leading the successful effort to institute same-day voter registration at early voting sites in the state. Given this experience, I want to begin by correcting a misunderstanding that members of both parties have, and that is that expanding voting rights only helps Democrats at the ballot box. And we have to look no farther than our Lieutenant Governor here, who won um, with expanded voting rights in North Carolina to see that North Carolina, a very purple state, um, elects people of both parties when we expand voting rights. In 2020, because the courts allowed our laws to stay in place and struck down voter suppression, North Carolina offered the longest voting period in the country. The State Board of Elections mailed absentee ballots to voters 60 days before the November 3rd election, earlier than any other state. In-person early voting was open for 19 days prior to the election, and same-day registration was allowed at all early voting locations, despite the efforts of the General Assembly to shut this down. Because of this ease, 75% of voters in North Carolina cast ballots, the vast majority of whom voted prior to election day in large part because of the coronavirus pandemic. Because of, not despite, this ease and access, Donald Trump, our Lieutenant Governor, and a collection of Republican judges secured statewide victory in the state along with members of the Council of State. North Carolina's experience proves that Republicans can and do win with ex an expanded electorate if they focus on generating enthusiasm and not blocking access to the ballot box. American voters are a lot smarter than many politicians believe. When candidates run on their records and policies, rather than relying on anti-democratic efforts to shrink the electorate, they can win big regardless of party affiliation. And we made that argument when we got same-day voter registration at early voting sites. So I have a question for Dr. Barber, not about these voting laws, but about the redistricting process that we're about to see all over the country again without having the uh, protections of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. So the census is coming in late, and we're going to have to have an abbreviated period um, for doing redistricting. And North Carolina, as we know, has a history of going to the Supreme Court over and over again. Tell me what you think will happen without um, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act in North Carolina under this abbreviated period. Reverend Barber, I think you're on mute. What will happen, will happen is what happened uh, before uh, in 2010, uh, where we had racialized voter suppression. That was even with uh, uh, the Section 5, but now certainly with Section 5 gone, we have seen all evidence that there will be further attempt 
to, to use the um, redistricting period as another way of, of voter suppression and another way of disenfranchisement. Again, the courts have ruled. I know my colleague from um, North Carolina keeps wanting to say it's just hyperbole, but the courts have ruled. The Supreme Court ruled that our gerrymandering was racialized gerrymandering, and then the, another court said it allowed an unconstitutionally constituted legislature. And let me say, uh, Representative Roth, just because African Americans get elected does not mean there is not discrimination going on, because that's why you examine it under the court, not just what people say, but under the court. In fact, the matter is, the courts have said time and time again, even after the ending of Shelby, it is said that North Carolina has engaged in intentional and surgical racism. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman Ross. I now recognize Mr. Roy from Texas for five minutes. I thank the Chairman. Uh, and I, look, I'm, I'm always interested when we talk about this subject that people just sort of gloss over the history and they start throwing uh, negative commentary towards the Shelby County decision. But, and I know there are a number of members in this room who are here uh, for the debate uh, in 2006, uh, leading up to the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act at that time. I too was here as a staffer on the Senate Judiciary Committee. So I lived it. I lived through and read through all those volumes of papers, I went through all the analysis. And the fact is, as we put into the record in the additional views in the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee, the fact is the formula that was being followed was an outdated formula that was 40 years old. It was being based on data from 1965, 1968, 1972, and it was not updated for the time in 2006 when this was passed. And that's clearly what the court said. Yet my colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to suggest that somehow this is all about perpetuating racism, it's about perpetuating uh, the harms that clearly existed as the distinguished gentleman from North Carolina made very clear in his review of the history of what the Jim Crow South actually looked like. And listening now to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and I saw this happen and unfold in the Senate Judiciary Committee where my friend Mike Lee was engaging with Senator Durbin talking about Jim Crow 2.0. And I was just on the floor of the House of Representatives and we were talking about DC statehood and we're hearing the same thing about Jim Crow 2.0 and we're talking about comparing the historic wrongs that occurred that this country worked hard to reform and fix and that the Voting Rights Act was so critical in doing in 1965. We're being seen that compared now to passing laws trying to make sure our election system can be believed and trusted and that voter identification can be used, and that mail-in ballots have bipartisan agreement that they have higher rates of fraud, that maybe we should do something to ensure that we have trust and belief in those mail-in ballots. The record, when we put it in at the time in 2006, it is really important for people to note that when the Voting Rights Act was adopted, the average registration rate for black voters in the seven original covered states was only 29.3%. Today, that was 2006, the voter registration rate among blacks, for example, in covered jurisdictions is over 68%, higher than the 62% found in non-covered jurisdictions. There was examples where the counties in Florida, where there were covered counties and non-covered counties. Interestingly, we noted in the, case, in the uh, submission, while Florida has five counties that are subject to Section 5 coverage, none of these counties were implicated by the accounts of dis discrimination submitted to the record in 2006. Yet there were five non-covered counties in Florida that were pointed out in the list of accounts that was produced in the record in 2006. All of this is arbitrary. Everything that is being done is arbitrary, and that's why the court kicked it out. That's the fact, and that's what we know. Now what do we have? The, the, the legislation being put forward now for voting rights uh, uh, authorization and, and expansion counts any change to a state's voter ID law as a mark against it. 36 states already have voter ID laws. That's what's being done. It's very specific. It's very purposeful. That's what's actually happening. Voting Rights Act punishes the states for improving the processes they use to clean up and maintain accurate voting rolls. They're making that an actual element and they're trying to compare that making sure that voting rolls, which have currently massive numbers of dead people registered, people who aren't in the state, people who have moved, where you can't have faith in the voting rolls, somehow that is gonna be equi uh, made equivalent to the Jim Crow South for which the Voting Rights Act was so important in 1965. And it undermines the Voting Rights Act to suggest, as Senator Durbin did, 
that if you opposed pre Section 5 preclearance and you opposed the absurdity of basing Section 5 preclearance on 40-year-old data, that somehow you're against the Voting Rights Act. That's what happens. Those are the political talking points. And I would just ask my, uh, our witness and, and the Lieutenant Governor from North Carolina if you could uh, help me understand. Was the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution passed and moved by Republicans or Democrats? Right, and was the movement to, be my, put your microphone on, sir. Uh, was that would the, be Republicans. Was the move for the 64 Civil Rights Act and 65 Voting Rights Act led heavily by Republicans or uh, Democrats? That, that would be Republicans. And so as we sit here today, and as we're being accused by many of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle of wanting to somehow perpetuate the Jim Crow South, when in fact what we're trying to do is perpetuate laws that you can believe in that you've so eloquently discussed, do you see any merit in that whatsoever? Absolutely not. And just can I, if I have a moment just to add something, uh, you know, when you talk about that history, uh, that history is clear who stood on which side at every turn in history. It is clear. It's not even in dispute and it's not in dispute now. What we want is integrity. We, we don't want power. We want integrity. We want the right thing to be done. We want to encourage citizens to be responsible. We want to have the best election system in the world, in the world. Third world countries, places like India where the poverty rate is staggering, they have to show that finger when they go vote. It's time that we modernize our election system in this country and stop playing all these silly games based on race. And please, stop using me as a black man as your pawn. And yes, I said it, to push your agenda. I'm sick of it. It happened a long time ago in this country and I'm tired Chairman, of Chairman, I would uh, ask that the witness answer the question. His time has expired. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I just have a unanimous consent request for, to insert something in the record. Unanimous consent to insert something in the record. Consent request. You've already said that we would we could enter that in the record. You said it in your opening, Mr. Chairman. What ha what changed? Mr. Johnson, can you hear me? So we're not going to insert Johnson. something in the record. So the Republicans can't enter anything minutes. in the record. I'm just so the need chair, clarification. The chairman doesn't want us to be able to insert stuff in the record. Maybe in a few minutes, but not right now. Oh, because okay, because when I had my time closing, I didn't want to insert it at the time inserted when I spoke. Mr. Johnson, we're going to go in pro proper order. You're recognized for five minutes. Well, this is a great way to run a hearing. What's Impressive. What's wrong? I think Mr. Johnson's video is frozen. Ms. Garcia, can you hear me? I guess you can't. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to all the witnesses who have joined us today. It is. Ms. Garcia, we cannot hear you. Here's your volume. Could you turn your volume up? Is that better? That's better. Start okay, the clock I'm over. Going. You're on. May I, Mr. Chairman, thank you. It is important to note that the Voting Rights Act was enacted at, at a time when Mex many African Americans, Latinos, and other minorities in southern states had been denied the right to vote. Even when attempting to register, organize, or even assist others in their attempt to register to vote, it meant risking their jobs, homes, and racial violence. Fast track years later, and it is appalling to know that the right to vote remains under constant attack. Last year, the American people overwhelmingly and undoubtedly voted to elect President Biden and Vice President Harris and Democrats to lead our country. Yet we witnessed former President Trump's efforts and his enablers attempt to discredit the 2020 election results by publicly promoting baseless claims that the vote was marred by fraud and irregularities. And while those who insisted there was election fraud were given ample opportunity to put forth competent evidence and entrust the American legal system to decide those issues, those blaming the fans uh, of election fraud were seriously mistaken. 
Even our own lieutenant governor in Texas went so far as to offer a million dollars, a million dollars as a reward to anyone who would come forward and produce and prove fraud. Well, I'm sure he still has his million dollars because no reward was ever made. And these baseless claims were pushed far enough to lead a mob to desecrate our U.S. Capitol, threaten members of Congress with their lives, and nearly pushed our, elect our country at the brink of destruction. This was not about stopping the steal. It's been about stopping the lies that have cost lives. Yet we're witnessing state legislators in 47 states that have introduced over 360 bills with restrictive voting provisions. I agree with my colleague and friend, Senator Castro, that in our home state of Texas, there is an all out assault on the right to vote. And I agree with Reverend Bar Barber. These are surgically targeted to get to the, the, the options for voting and methods of voting that work the best in our minority communities. This discriminatory bills are not about voter security. They're about voter suppression by, by preserving partisan political advantage by burdening minority communities. And let me just say to those who think that it's really simple to just go out there and get the voter ID, you know, as someone who is the eighth of 10 children born in my own aunt's house, not by a doctor, not with, but delivered by a midwife, you know, I really don't have a birth certificate because, but I have a baptismal certificate because being Catholic, they did take me to get the order to get baptized. So there are many people still like me, particularly older Americans in many rural parts of our state, in states, areas around the country that can't produce an ID. And it's, I can tell you, I've been through um, questions when I vote that even as a state senator, they would not accept my Senate ID because I'd forgotten my driver's license. And I have to remind them that as a state senator, one, one of the qualifications is that you're born in the state of Texas, that you're a certain age, that obviously, if I could run for election, stand for election, I could vote. There are things that are still happening on the ground and we must put them to a stop. So my question first goes to uh, Secretary Castro. Secretary Castro, could you tell me why Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act and the preclearance uh, provisions are just so important uh, in states like Texas to stop some of the shenanigans uh, that are going on around the state and that are being considered right now as you and I sit here. Our legislature is enacting even more restrictive uh, provisions. Can you tell me why the VRA is just so important? Uh, yes, and uh, thank you for your leadership on this, Representative Garcia. Uh, Texas has a very strong, clear, consistent pattern of enacting laws that uh, disenfranchise particularly voters of color. Uh, before the Voting Rights Act came along, after the Voting Rights Act came along, and then after the Shelby County decision in 2013, just since that time, Texas has taken a number of steps, uh, some of which I've mentioned, closing 750 polling locations that tended to be in areas uh, where there are concentrations of black and brown voters uh, requiring photo ID. When they did that, right away, there were 600,000 Texans who were registered to vote uh, that did not have the requisite ID. They were disproportionately black and brown. Uh, uh, on top of that, HB6 and SB7 today that would absolutely have uh, a negative impact on the ability of voters, particularly black and brown voters, to cast a ballot. One of the things I haven't mentioned, but let me just give you another example, because this really is about far more than voter ID. If it were only about voter ID, that would be all that's in the legislation that's being proposed in Texas or North Carolina or Georgia. It's way beyond that. We can tell that. Um, Harris County in the last election allowed for voting uh, overnight for shift workers. Doesn't matter whether they're Democrat, Republican, Independent, who they are, but shift workers to be able to vote if they had to at 1 a.m., 4 a.m. Uh, and it was wildly successful. 
This legislation in Texas would strip the ability of Harris County to do that. Now, what does it matter whether somebody, if they go through the same procedures, if they're eligible to vote, votes at uh, two in the morning because that's when they can most conveniently do it because they have a job uh, that requires that, that you know, they do it at that time. What does it matter if they do it at 2 a.m. or they do that at, at 10 a.m. in the morning? It doesn't. Uh, but this is part of a consistent pattern Texas has shown to disenfranchise black and brown voters. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you, Ms. Garcia. Thank you, I yield back. I now recognize Mr. Mr. Roy for the purpose of introducing uh, the unanimous consent request. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I've asked unanimous consent to insert in the record the additional views of Senators John Cornyn and Tom Coburn from 2006 from the uh, committee report from the Senate Judiciary Committee. Without objection, shall be done. Mr. Owen. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Could I ask unanimous consent to uh, submit for the record an article from the Houston Chronicle on Texas voting bills target Democratic strongholds just like Georgia's laws? For the record. Without objection, that'll be done as well. Thank you, Ms. Carson. Thank you, sir. Mr. Owens, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking, ranking, ranking member. Uh, soft, the soft bigotry of low expectations in the 1990s has now evolved into, in 2020-21 to hardcore racism. We now have elected officials, black and white, who have no shame that will state that being black, if you're black and poor, you're incapable of doing what every other American does to function and progress. Simply, if you're black and poor, progress, success, travel, education, a bank account, visiting this body is not for you. Lieutenant Governor Robertson, today's uh, Democratic Party wants us to believe that your mother's journey from poverty to a son now sitting uh, as, as a national leader is impossible. They want us to believe that my grandfather's journey from poverty to his son in 1950, getting a PhD, is impossible. Hardcore racism is very simply this. It seems that the Democratic Party thinks it's impossible for poor and black people to get an ID for voting, but it is not even questionable to get a welfare check or public assistance. I think the next uh, hearing should probably deal with considering welfare IDs as Jim Crow. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Robertson, Atlanta Journal uh, Constitution poll, uh, poll found that 63% of black respondents agreed with requiring voter ID. Why do you think Democrats allege that it's so difficult for black people to get an ID that will, press, that will suppress their vote? Microphone. Microphone, Lieutenant Governor. Mic Sorry. Uh, I'll repeat my prior statement. Uh, as a Republican, I can't speak for how Dem Democrats think, so I, I can't actually answer that question. But I can tell you this, for me, what it all boils down to is responsibility. Uh, you mentioned something that people often say, the soft bigotry of low expectation. I, I no longer call that soft bigotry. I call that the hard bit bigotry of low expectation. Uh, I, I'll go back to my mom. You referred to, to, to folks in your past. Uh, the way I saw my mom succeed was to be responsible. My mom did not wait on the federal government to feed her children. My mom had a fifth grade education. When my father died, she had never worked outside the house. She got a job as a custodian to take care of her children. Uh, I look at my own life. Uh, the more responsible I became as a young man, the more successful I became as a young man. And so I would say this, uh, I can't say how anyone else thinks, but certainly for myself and my party, I believe we all believe it's about responsibility. And ultimately responsibility drives freedom. Responsibility drives excellence. And I believe in voter, when you talk about voter integrity, you talk about our voting laws and our voting system, responsibility will drive us towards a perfect or nearly perfect uh, voting system where any question of fraud can be purged and whoever wins, wins fairly. Lieutenant Governor Robinson, thank you uh, for your life, your message. It's a message that uh, all Americans need to hear, particularly our race at this particular time. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I want to yield my remaining time to the gentleman from North Carolina. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Robinson, in your comments, you mentioned that in Vice President Harris's visit to North Carolina just this past week, she visited uh, the Greensboro location, I think, of the Woolworths lunch counter, famous uh, site of the uh, desegregation. Yes. Um, 
conflict. And, and our mutual friend Clarence Henderson was omitted, even though he's local, he was omitted from that event. Yes. I want to ask you about yourself. Um, we hear that this is a lot about Democrats or solicitous of the, of the opportunities for uh, people of color and Republicans are not, which I think you stand as repudiation of just by your uh, office and what you're doing these days. But has the governor of North Carolina, the Democrat governor, Roy Cooper, reached out to you to uh, celebrate your election, your unprecedented election, and uh, integrate you into his administration? O only once. And uh, me and the governor are diametrically opposed politically, but I can tell you this, I've made this plain. Uh, just as in the case with uh, Mr. Henderson and the vice president, uh, I think those are perfect times when we can take a step back and realize our common interests as Americans. Uh, certainly at that moment, I think that would have been a unifying uh, message to have this uh, Republican black man who actually sat at the lunch counter there with the Democratic vice president, a woman of color who was the first woman vice president. It would have been a unifying uh, moment for, for the country. The country could have seen that despite our political differences, we can set those political differences aside to highlight the best of us. And what we would have seen there would have been the best of us. The same way is true in North Carolina. I desperately want to work with our governor in North Carolina. I want to sit down in his office. I want to share my ideas. I want him to share his ideas. And I want us to uh, highlight the best of us, not the worst of us. But oftentimes, that's very difficult. In our, in our case, it turns out that the opposite has happened. Go back. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Owens. Mr. Johnson, it's your, 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 you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. Voters should not have to jump through hoops or traverse a cynically complicated obstacle course just to vote. The right to vote is not a privilege. Voting is a fundamental right. And the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed to enable Black people in America to exercise that fundamental right that had been historically denied to us by states like Texas, North Carolina, and of course, Georgia. In 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court gutted the preclearance provision of the VRA, and having been freed from the restrictions of Section 5, those same jurisdictions that had historically denied the right to vote to Black Americans immediately sprung into action into resuming uh, their sordid history of passing laws to suppress the right to vote. Georgia legislators used Donald Trump's big lie as their justification for passing Senate Bill 202, but the American people know that it was just a pretext and another big lie. When over half the states in the union are hell-bent on developing more ingenious ways to suppress the minority vote, while the other half are endeavoring to make voting easier for all, we find ourselves with a democracy that is simultaneously becoming more backward and undemocratic and more progressive. To quote Abraham Lincoln, our democracy cannot continue half slave and half free. The stark contrast between the active voter suppression going on in states, including the state of Georgia, with the automatic voting in states like Oregon illustrates that principle. And it's time that we as the People's House rise to this threat to our democracy and pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which will be reintroduced soon by our colleague, the gentlelady from Alabama, Congresswoman Terry Sewell. Congress must make clear once and for all that voting is a right that must be protected at all costs. At the time of the Shelby County decision, the entire state of Georgia was subject to the Section 5 preclearance regime of the Voting Rights Act. And after that decision, Georgia kicked its goal of suppressing black voters into high gear. This year, Georgia enacted the latest round of Jim Crow 2.0, an assault on voting rights, some of the most restrictive in the country. A Gwinnett County Republican official, a county partly within my district in Georgia, was quoted earlier this year as saying that he wants laws that limit no excuse absentee voting, quote, so we at least have a shot at winning, end quote. Reverend Barber, given your extensive experience with civil rights, educate us as to why these changes to, to voting in Georgia 
will specifically help Republicans in the state? Well, whether in Georgia, in Arizona, in North Carolina, what we know when these uh, um, um, kinds of laws are examined is that they not only hurt black people and brown people and indigenous people, but they also hurt poor white people. One of the ways we know this is because, for instance, in North Carolina, to Representative Johnson, this is what the General Assembly did and probably what they did in Georgia. They asked for all the data on how early voting, same day registration, 16, 17 year old voting, so forth and so on, impacted black voters. And then they made their decision on which parts of the law they would, 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 would create or would erase based on that data. That's why the court said that it was surgical racism. It was not just happenstance. Well, Pastor Barber, I know that the state of Georgia looked critically at the ways in which uh, voter turnout was accomplished and then endeavored to restrict those ways, those ways so as to suppress those who voted because of those uh, tactics. And so, uh, Mr. Uh, or, or Lieutenant Governor Robinson, you said that in America, there's no longer an effort to suppress the votes of black people. Uh, when did we get to that point? Yes, you cut your, okay. you are, uh, you know, yeah, when did when did we get to that point? You, you I can't you said put it my finger there. exactly. A, I can't put right, my well, finger exactly on when that happened, but I know that is not but happening it, but now. It, but you know that it's no longer happening now. But would you agree that there was a need for the 1965 Voting Rights Act? Absolutely, uh, Democrats made that possible with their institutions. So, so your the argument Pro then is your argument then is that sometime between. 1965 and today that voter suppression went away. Yes, because what you're telling because great progress has been made in this country uh, amongst uh, black right. people. And that, that is obvious. Okay, well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ms. DeLeon, uh, Senate Bill 202 signed into law by Georgia's Republican Governor Brian Kemp last Hank, month. Hank, we are over time, I'm afraid. Okay, Johnson. all right. Uh, are you back? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Didn't you're realize welcome. that. And do we have voting starting? We'll try to keep going. We get 30 minutes for the vote. Uh, the next person, who's on the Republican side, is next. Y'all, everybody's done their questioning. All right, the next is uh, uh, Mr. Raskin. Are you ready? Yeah, yes, I am. You're recognized for five minutes, Mr. Um, Raskin. Okay, um, and then forgive me. We've been uh, debating DC statehood. Uh, on the floor. Um, it's a great moment for America when we get to extend voting rights and self-representation to 712,000 tax-paying draftable U.S. citizens. So uh, those people who are here on both sides of the aisle who are uh, championing voting rights uh, should presumably be uh, out there organizing for D.C. statehood. Unfortunately, we are not getting any uh, support from across the aisle today on that. But Mr. Chairman, uh, the, thank you for calling the hearing. Uh, I, I did catch the um, distinguished uh, Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina speaking very strongly on behalf of the driver's license and the, uh, the photo ID for voting. And he said that the reason that he supported it is because it works even as a, uh, as a champion in the Second Amendment. He said, he's, he said that it works for, um, for the purchase of firearms. So I just want to make sure I've got his argument right. Do you support the use of photo ID for all voters in all circumstances? And then do you support the use of uh, photo ID, driver's license, for all firearm purchases? Uh, yes, sir, in both, I do. Okay, so, so you would support HR 8, the universal violent criminal uh, voter, uh, rather, um, firearm purchase law? which is being opposed by Republicans in Congress. I just want to uh, make sure you're, you're on our side on this. <laughs> love this. Love the bait and switch thing here. I love it. It's great. Fantastic. Oh, well, you're sorry. leaving out a myriad of things that that bill covers, sir, so we're not, even, we're not even going to discuss that because you're leaving out a myriad of things. I'm well, talking about a common right, sense issue me, of making sure we don't sell guns to people who have been adjudicated legally. We're not talking about a bill. Reclaiming my time. 
the lieutenant governor said that he supported the use of photo ID for all firearm purchases. That's precisely the purpose of HR 8, which says we will close the internet loophole, we will close the private gun show loophole, and we will close the private gun sale loophole. And I just want to make sure he's been consistent in his argument. He wants it for everybody trying to vote and everybody trying to get a firearm. He wants a photo ID to be used, correct? I believe that all FFL should have, should require, all FFL should have, require an ID no, no, when first no, people are coming in to purchase a firearm. You support, I, I think the logic of your argument is that we should have universal use of photo ID for the purchase of firearms. At least you based your entire argument about why we should do voting that way on firearms. So I just wanted to make sure that's your position. Uh, Reverend Barber, let me come to you if I could. Can you explain why voting is the heart of the American political creed in a way we understand it's the right preservative of all other rights. If you don't have the right to vote, you can't defend yourself in other ways. And yet at the same time, there has been a constant undertow of efforts to deny people their voting rights with grandfather clauses, literacy tests, poll taxes, making people wait in line for six hours, eight hours, rolling back early voting, rolling back weekend voting. Why do we have this constant struggle in our country. It, it doesn't exist in a lot of democratic countries where it is a universal commitment to give everybody the right to vote to make sure everybody's registered. What is different about America? Well, what is different is, has been the issue of race and the issue of economics. Dr. King said it was the very threat of the possibility of black masses and, and white masses joining together to overcome the white aristocracy that created voter suppression and segregation in the first place. You know, there's been a lot of distortions that have been put out here in this hearing. Uh, my grandfather was a Republican, but he was a Lincoln Teddy Roosevelt Republican. He was not a strong Thurman Republican. And what we have seen is that ever since the Southern strategy, uh, uh, the strong Thurman type Republicans, Jesse Ham's type Republican, decided that particularly in the South, they were going to use that strategy and use uh, ways of uh, in, in implementing voter suppression. And whether you call it Jim Crow 2 or Jane Crow or Jane Crow Esquire, it is always an attempt to act benign, to act like it does not undermine the right to vote. But in fact, it does okay. black, brown, and, right, right. and it, in, it disables our ability to change the political system and the economic system in this country I, for the good I of I all people. I got one final question I want to ask you if I could. There are more than 350 bills now around the country trying to roll back people's voting rights, restrict their voting rights uh, in America today. Explain how a new Voting Rights Act, an updated Voting Rights Act, would protect people against their right to vote being impeded on in this all of those, We need those bills to have to be pre-cleared. The Republicans should not fear them being pre-cleared and examined before they're implemented and before they're used in suppressive ways. Pre-clear all of these decisions under the Voting Rights Act, judge them by the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment. If they pass that, let them go into law. Thank you, Reverend Barber. We, we've only got a few minutes. We've got to vote. But we're going to recognize Ms. Bush for five minutes, and then we're going to recognize Ms. Jackson Lee for five minutes, and then we're going to wrap up and run vote. Ms. Bush, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, St. Louis and I thank you, Chairman Cohen, for convening this crucial hearing. You know, our right to vote, and I know it's been said, you know, before, but our right to vote is the foundation of our democracy. The right to vote is our instrument for change. Who we choose to represent us is a reflection of our struggles, our hopes, and our aspirations as a country and as a society. And I know because I'm one of those people. I would be remiss not to start today's remarks by taking stock of the fact that the Voting Rights Act came into fruition because of the tireless work of civil rights champions, the thousands of protesters who took to the streets and the many black, and black men and black women who showed up and spoke out. They were bloodied and beaten, brutalized in the movement to protect and affirm our sacred right to vote. In 1965, they rose up to demand a say in our democracy. And in 2021, we are still rising up demanding that our voices be heard. In the aftermath of the Shelby decision in my home state of Missouri, Republicans have passed unnecessary, unnecessary 
and restrictive voter ID laws and a notary requirement to deny black people and, and uh, brown people and um, people living in poverty access to the ballot box. We've seen polling places in our communities close, which happens all over the place. We've seen it in roadblocks put up to prevent currently and formerly incarcerated people from reclaiming their rights. But we continue to fight. In 2020, we turned out in record numbers, despite the unprecedented obstacles put in place by a white supremacist system. Black and brown voters, organizers delivered victories up and down the ballot. We know this. With this Democratic majority, though, we now have the power to level the playing field by striking down racist laws that seek only to continue the history of disenfranchisement of Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. So I want to ask Reverend Barber, good afternoon and so good to have this moment with you. Um, you, have been in the, you have been active in the fight for civil, uh, with the civil rights movement for decades. How have discriminatory voting practices evolved to be less overtly racially discriminatory since the 1960s? Well, and I think what they do is they don't actually say the language we're doing this because it's racist, so you have to investigate the data. You have to look at the kind of request they make for data and then how they make those decisions about what laws they're going to put in place based on the data. That's what happened in North Carolina. They asked how these uh, new voting laws would help black people, such as same-day registration, early voting, and then those are the things they went after. And what they're afraid of is not just black voters, it's the black, white, brown, Asian, indigenous coalition. 55% of poor and low wealth people voted in this past election for the current president that we have. It's that fusion coalition. And, and they know, lastly, that it only has to be surgical, and many times it only has to be a cutting or, 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 or suppressing one or two percent of the vote in order for there to be fundamental uh, uh, um, um, change in who gets elected. Thank you for teaching, Reverend Barber. Secretary Castro, many of these so-called election integrity laws that are currently making their way through state legislatures are measures that have been shown to suppress minority turnout. How do we make sure that states like Missouri, which were not part of the preclearance states previously, are still held accountable for their voter discrimination? Thank you, Representative Bush, uh, and thank you for your leadership on these issues. I think that's why this legislation is so fundamentally important going forward, because it helps ensure that uh, these kind of discriminatory voting measures are not put in place. And by updating the uh, the, what used to be Section 4B and essentially states that would be subject uh, to preclearance, by updating that, it allows for the inclusion of places that uh, may not have been covered before but may be covered now because of a pattern of discriminatory practices since the Shelby County decision and then going forward. Um, uh, you know, this legislation is one of the best ways that we can ensure that everybody in our country, regardless of the color of their skin or their background, who is eligible to vote, has convenient access to the franchise. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. <laughs> um, I, you know, and I'll close with this. In the words of the late Congressman John Lewis, when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to do something. Today, we honor his legacy by doing just that. Thank you for answering my questions, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Uh, we now recognize for five minutes Representative Sheila Jackson Lee of the great state of Texas. I thank you. The historic record should be clarified that President Lyndon Baines Johnson initiated the Voting Rights Act of 1965 after the brutal killing of the uh, four little girls and the Selma uh, to Montgomery March and the brutalizing of John Robert Lewis. We're delighted that moderate Republicans joined in that vote. Uh, subsequently, however, I'm reminded of the fact that the President Johnson said we've lost the South. And of course, the South began to turn Republican. Those were the oppressors putting on a different party affiliation. Uh, let me, General, I understand in 2020, um, President, former President Trump won North Carolina. Do you believe that was a legitimate election? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer into the record um, the um, 
article that says, here are the Republicans who objected to the Electoral College vote um, in 2020, and there were one, two, three, four, five of our members here who are now uh, talking about uh, the issue of voting. I'd like to submit this into the record, and I'll make the point later. Without uh, objection. Thank you so very much. Let me um, go quickly uh, to uh, Ms. Uh, De Leon, and my time is very short. Make your answers very short. I respect you. Since the Shelby Court County decision, some have floated the notion that there is no problem with enforcement of the Voting Rights Act as it stands because there are still adequate remedies under the statute to continue strong voting rights enforcement. What is your response? Ms. De Leon? Thank you so much. Uh, yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, at, the Voting Rights Act uh, is key, um, and the preclearance is key because there's still intentional discrimination. Um, and I believe there's been some confusion, and I'd like to clear it up uh, today. Um, civil rights advocates are not against photo ID. Um, we're against manipulating photo ID to cut voters out. Uh, in North Dakota, immediately after Native voters flexed their political power and influenced a race for U.S. Senate, the state legislator restricted the types of photo ID and required photo ID with an address on it when they knew there are Native Americans in North Dakota that do not have addresses on their homes, which, by the way, is a whole other injustice. And we took that case to court. And the Republican-appointed federal judge agreed the law was unconstitutional and, viola uh, and violated the 14th Amendment. Um, the state legislator then passed the law again in defiance of the court. And that is intentional discrimination happening today. Um, and that case was not resolved until last year. Um, respectfully, a no amount of personal responsibility will put an address on a home. And when it is suggested that Thank only you. a state ID is acceptable, that shows you know, a, 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 an ignorance of the reality on the ground facing Native Americans. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for representing Native Americans. And let me, Lieutenant Governor Robinson, let me um, correct that. Will, will, will the lady yield? Uh, and uh, let me also thank you for your service. Uh, Reverend will Barber, the, I have a short period yield? of time. I have a short period of time, Reverend Barber. We have been hearing all throughout this session that race does not matter. Uh, would you briefly, I only have, I have to ask uh, Secretary Castro a question, please. Would you briefly uh, categorize how a race has seen a proliferation of oppressive voting rights laws, even though, as you said, if we all work together, we can get uh, equality. How does race, racism, uh, impact all of these voting rights laws being written by Republican legislatures across America? Systemic racism, policy-based racism does matter. It, it, it matters because it's a violation of the 15th Amendment, the 14th Amendment. And let me just read the Supreme Court and answer your question. About the gerrymandering case in North Carolina, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a remarkable per curiam decision striking down as a sweeping unconstitutional racial gerrymandering the maps that created an unaccountable legislative supermajority in the state house, therefore creating an unconstitutionally constituted legislature. Thank the you, Supreme Reverend. Court. Thank you, Reverend. I, I, I love you and thank you for your service. I've got it. They're cutting me off. Thank you so very much. That is powerful what you said. Uh, Secretary Castro, thank you for your mother's work. Uh, my predecessor who endorsed me, the Honorable Barbara Jordan, was able to get uh, Hispanics included in the language of the 1965 Voting Rights Act when she came to Congress. I subsequently was here for the historic reauthorization. What impact did that making sure that Texas was included uh, and Hispanics were actually included in the empowerment of Hispanic voters, which are racial definition in many instances, what did it do for this state? Thank you for the question, uh, Representative Jackson Lee, and for your leadership. And that 1975 extension to language minorities was groundbreaking. And what it meant was much greater participation, particularly in, in the Mexican-American community, Latino community there in Texas, uh, greater election of first choice candidates from those communities that changed the face of governance across the state of Texas and in many other places, it empowered millions of people. Thank you. There's not enough time, Mr. Mr. Um, Chairman. I, I just want to finish as I, just one sentence just to say, uh, this represents all of the Republicans who voted against uh, the legitimacy of the Biden election. Included in it are those who challenged Georgia and Fulton County in particular, which was dominated by African-Americans. Someone 
will, in another hearing, Mr. Chairman, explain to me why this is not all about race. That is what it's about. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee. That concludes our hearing today. I want to thank all of our witnesses for appearing today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written requests for witnesses or additional materials for the record. With that, the hearing is adjourned. Reverend Bar Barber, God bless you. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. God bless you, Reverend. Thank you so very much. Forgive me. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. One more time. One more time.